From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number 46, recorded on June 7, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast on the body's defenders against disease. Joining us today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hello, welcome back. Is it really hot up there? It is. Yeah. East <laughs> I'm Coast sweating. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No air conditioning because it doesn't usually get that hot here, but it's been close to 90 all week. And so mm. it hasn't been cooling off at night as much as it normally does. It's also summer. joining us from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hey there. Very hot here. I don't know what it is. <laughs> 90 something. So, yes. But it's going and well. from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi. It's hot here too. Last I checked, it was 93. Haven't been outside in a while, so probably is more than that now. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, heat wave. It's okay. Science goes on. That's right. The labs are air conditioned, so I mean, we're fine, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So your house is not air conditioned, Cindy, right? No. All right. No. Well, along with the mic and the camera, I'm going to send you. I'll send you an air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> I have one, but we put it downstairs. We don't usually warm this upstairs, and I'm I'm, yeah. I'm in a separate room here. Yeah. Cindy, my office, in fact, has excess air conditioning. I'm usually too can cold here, so if I can just send it over to you, that <laughs> would be pipe perfect. Pipe it in. Yeah, we'll put a pipe in and. And send that it might up. be a long pipe. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got all these oil pipelines, right? Why not? Yeah, yeah natural just, gas. Not sure by right. the time it gets to you, though, it'll be warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Today, we have, uh, uh, we're going to talk about bats. Yes. Yep. We I'm are. Excited. And uh, uh, Brianne, you're going to tell us all about this, right? I am. So bats are really fascinating in terms of their immune systems. Um, and one of the reasons for that, of course, is, or one of the reasons why we thought about this is because they are hosts for an awful lot of viruses. We can see bats uh, infected with many, many different viruses. A lot of times we talk about them as having asymptomatic infections hmm. um, in response to those viruses, although um, some of that's a little bit uncertain. I'm not sure that we have sampled all the bats and uh, nor do we have the ability to ask them about their symptoms. <laughs> um, to completely know that they are entirely asymptomatic, um, but they they don't seem to be making sort of constant immune responses to these viral infections. They are particularly long lived for the size of um, their bodies, and unsurprisingly, uh, they are the only mammals that fly. Um, <laughs> And that actually becomes well, really well on their own, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> true. true. Yes, very true. Yeah, um, I read something about for the for the size of their body, you know, the ratio there. Um, there's and lifespan compared to humans. There's 19 species that are longer lived than us, and 18 of them are bats. I think. Wow, isn't that yeah. crazy? There's exactly. how many different species of bats? Like. 1600 or something, something like that. It's about 20% wow. of all mammals. That's crazy. Um, yeah, in terms of the it's number amazing, of species isn't it? there are. Yeah. It, I'm always amazed at how many different types there are and how many different ones I didn't know about. Um, Which and really they just range means in size from like extremely, extremely tiny microbats to microbats? megabats that oh, have. Yeah, I don't want to run into one of those megabats. They're yeah, huge. <laughs> unbelievably huge um, wingspans. They're kind of cute though, right? Like the fruit bats are big, but they're cute. I mean, they are kind of cute. I like, yeah, I like them. <laughs> but if there's micro and macro bats and all these bats that we really don't know about, there are probably lots of viruses that we don't know about. We only know, a fr we've only probably sampled a fraction yeah, of what we know. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if I remember correctly, Vincent, we had talked about a paper on TWIV recently um, where they had done some sampling in um, an area in Thailand. And it was something like, you know, a hole. I can't remember. It was a uh, <laughs> irrigation pipe. Yeah, um, it was, you know, it was an irrig but I couldn't remember what it was, but it was sort of small and they just sort of sampled the bats they could reach and came up with huge numbers of new viruses. Yeah. Um, now they all had a SARS-CoV-2 like virus. Yes. That Pretty was much. why. <laughs> I think it was a, it was in this little pipe, 300 bats and they all had, you know, a lot of viruses, but they all had the same SARS-CoV-2 like virus, which, hmm. wow. you know, these bats are all, when they're all in the area together they're sharing their viruses too right? yep. 
Yeah, so I think there also has been some questions about the fact that bats are living in such large groups um, that they may be able to spread um, infections very easily um, from bat to bat. They fly large distances. Uh, so there are a lot of things that may make them unique as viral hosts. Um, but flight also is actually really unique. Um, in order to be able to fly, they uh, bats actually have to uh, have some unique metabolic capacities. It takes a lot of energy to be able to fly, and so they have to do a lot of oxidative phosphorylation. And when doing that oxidative phosphorylation, they have the side effect of a fair amount of stress on their cells, uh, DNA damage, um, and so they're dealing with this, these DNA damage issues um, quite a bit. Mm. Uh, and that DNA may end up in the cytoplasm, um, as might RNA um, from some of those viruses or DNA uh, coming from damage that's happening because of viral infection. Um, and I find this part interesting because uh, I spend a lot of time in my lab thinking about cytosolic DNA sensing. Interesting. Uh, yeah, so we, we have a group of proteins in the cytoplasm of cells that are able to sense DNA. Um, this was something, this was sort of um, definitely not something that people thought a lot about when I started grad school, but it came out more and more. Um, and the idea is that your DNA, if, if DNA is in the cytoplasm, something's wrong. Um, it may be viral DNA that's uh, replicating there, um, or it may be, uh, as we are finding out more and more, DNA that's come out of the nucleus because of damage or DNA that's come out of the mitochondria because of damage. Mm. Um, and all of those things can be sensed by um, some DNA sensing proteins of the innate immune system. Um, so when these sensors were first identified, I always, and I still have this question about, what about replication? When you break down the nuclear membrane and cytoplasm is supposed to be in, or DNA is supposed to be in the cytoplasm. How do you differentiate between when it's supposed to be there and when it's not supposed to be there? It's not the per point of our discussion today, but I still think it's an intriguing question. Yeah, so I also think it's an intriguing question. Um, and one of the reasons why I think it's also an intriguing question is that um, I talk about this or we talk about this as cytosolic DNA sensing, That's but right. there's some evidence that some of these sensors uh, spend some time in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so we might wonder how we can differentiate between healthy host DNA, healthy self DNA, and non-self or damaged DNA. Um, that's something that people are still really looking at. In the case of one of these sensors, CGAS, mm -hmm. people have seen some different phosphorylations of CGAS that might happen in the nucleus that turn it on and off. And there may be some relationship with the cell cycle control um, so that CGAS is turned off during some phases of the cell cycle. Mm. Um, so some of the kinases that are involved in cell cycle control may also turn off CGAS during some phases of the cell cycle. And I saw something about um, relevant to this is mitochondrial damage is also released in reactive oxygen species, which can oxidize DNA. And so it could be a two hit to, to recognize modified or damaged d DNA that might be sensed in that mechanism as well, which could be yeah. interesting. Yeah, exactly. And I think that exactly how oxidized DNA um, is specifically recognized and which sensors may be involved in that is, is still being worked out a bit. But that's a, another big place that people are, are really thinking about this in terms of that oxidized DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And so, um, and obviously this is a problem not only for pathogens that are replicating inside of our cells, but then if it's self damage, right, from our own um, from our own DNA could lead to autoimmune diseases. Um, so, so from both ends of either yourself or something coming into your cells from the outside of your body, this is really important. And it is interesting. I think that's probably one of the hottest fields right now is to try to understand what these sensors are and how do you tell the difference between DNA that's either inside the nucleus or outside. You have phosphorylation, adapter proteins, trend, like yes. I, the oxidized. I didn't even, I hadn't thought about that. I'm sure I read about it somewhere, but that, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's making me want to do some more deep dives into this, into this yeah, field. Yeah. And, and it's also really interesting in terms of thinking about kind of a first line of defense against transformation as cells might be picking up damage to their DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the importance of this in cancer biology, as well as, um, a number of different types of auto-inflammatory diseases that have been found where people have, um, issues with some of the genes involved in this where they make too much interferon. Um, and they have things like uh, diseases called interferonopathies, um, mm -hmm. where they're making excess interferon uh, and having autoimmune type uh, disease states. 
Right. Um, and I saw something cool about they, they think bats don't get tumors. So there might be something about the sensing pathway as well that's involved in that, which I thought yeah, was kind of cool. Yeah, I think that's really cool too. And I love kind of thinking about how that might play a, be related to what's going on with their really long lifespans. Yep. And how all of those things might link together. Right. Uh, yeah, and the other I thing I was thinking of, I, there's some connections between, and I think this is more recent, but um, spontaneous miscarriages. I mean, I think there's like 15 to 20% of pregnancies are miscarried within that first trimester, and it's difficult to know why, right? They're not, they're unidentified reasons. And so there's some literature to suggest that if, if you have, you know, um, a mutation or an integration or something that causes damage to the DNA, and then it can be sensed in that way, and then the cell essentially takes care of the issue, but it's so early that you wouldn't, you wouldn't know. Yeah, I, I think there are lots of really fascinating things. There's also mm -hmm. been some really cool papers about how DNA sensing might have to be um, turned off at fertilization to allow fertilization to occur. Right, right, right. So this uh, uh, this is interesting. I just found a Nature paper. Yeah, bats have a very low incidence of tumors, and one of the reasons is they have a an efflux pump that yep. pumps out genotoxic chemicals hmm. more than other organisms. How about that? Interesting. I saw that. Yeah. They also, I, I think I, I read that they have an expansion of um, the proteins that are involved in detecting DNA damage and That's halting right. mm -hmm. yeah. proliferation so that you're not expanding those and, and proliferating those damage events. Yeah. Basically, yep. the more I learn about bat immune systems, uh, the more fascinated I am <laughs> about bat immune systems. Hmm. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Um, so that if we have this damaged DNA um, or pathogen DNA in the cytoplasm, um, it can lead to interferon production, as we've kind of implied. Um, there are a number of different sensors that can sense that DNA. Um, they include um, one called CGAS, um, they, one called IFI-16, one called DDX-41. There's a whole list of them but they all have in common this signaling adapter protein called STING. Um, and STING is in the ER. It stands for Stimulator of Interferon Genes. Very and, original. <laughs> yes, very original. Um, and it can activate, it actually moves um, from the ER to the Golgi and can activate some downstream signaling, particularly a kinase TBK1 um, and some uh, transcription factors, the IRFs, in order to turn on um, interferon beta. Um, Sting is really kind of interesting. It has this tail, a C-terminal tail, that has multiple phosphorylation sites that allow some of these downstream signaling proteins to dock. And so it provides kind of a platform that allows the kinase and the transcription factor to be brought close to one another um, so that the kinase TBK can phosphorylate this transcription factor. So there's this, this sort of tail that's a platform onto which other proteins can bind. And I'm just interested, uh, yeah. both of you, uh, Brian and Cindy, work on DNA sensors or sensors in the cytoplasm. What, what aspect are you interested in that your lab looks at? It? Do you look at Sting in particular or something else? Um, we are so, starting to. Oh, okay. So... <laughs> Uh, we, we do. So I am particularly interested in the sensors. Um, I especially think about the sensor IFI-16 a lot, um, as well as CGAS. And we're trying to figure out some of the unique roles of IFI-16 and CGAS. Um, and so uh, both of those go through Sting. And so we do experiments involving uh, Sting quite often. In fact, I was sort of laughing as I was looking at one part of this paper today because I was basically doing the mm -hmm. same kind of experiment <laughs> that was in the figure. Cool. Um, so basically the question um, that people have were thinking about is how do bats control excess type 1 interferon production when they have all of this DNA from all of these viruses or when they have all of this DNA damage? Um, people have looked a little bit before. They've seen some alterations in the type 1 interferon and the type 3 interferon loci. Um, they've seen um, some changes in some of the other DNA sensing pattern recognition receptors. So I mentioned uh, in answer to Stephanie's question, I really like this uh, receptor IFI-16. The entire family of genes that IFI-16 belongs to has been deleted in bats. Um, and crazy. so... 
yeah, I think that that's really interesting. So there are, uh, it seems there's going to be a bunch of different changes in the DNA sensing uh, type one interferon uh, pathway, but there hadn't really been a ton that had been looked at about cytosolic DNA sensing um, in them before this paper. And I suppose I should mention uh, we this paper is by uh, Z et al. Um, and they are coming from um, the uh, CAS Key Laboratory of Spe Special Pathogens and Biosafety at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, um, as well as uh, Beijing and uh, the Duke NUS uh, Medical School in Singapore. Um, and so these authors decided to focus on sting um, because it is in common out of all of the different uh, cytosolic DNA sensing pathways. All of the different known sensors all signal through this same adapter. Um, so let me ask you one question before we start talking about the data. Yeah, Do you think it's it. odd that it's completely lacking all of the sensors that, or at least the DNA sensors, so maybe I'm answering my own question here, leading to sting, yet you still have sting? Right? So are there, what, there are other ways to activate sting. So there are other ways to activate sting. Um, I think that they are missing the pihens, so they're missing IFI-16 and its relatives. They are not missing mm. CGAS. Um, so they are not missing all of the sensors. Right. They're missing some, um, but not all of them because they do need to be protected against viral infection somewhat. Right, and they still have RNA sensors, is that correct? And they do still have RNA sensors, And yes. those also use sting? Uh, not many. Okay. So the the canonical uh, pathway is that sting is going through DNA sensors, although there are a few um, less canonical times where RNA may go through sting. But the, the traditional textbook way this works is that DNA sensing is going through sting. And I don't um, mean to say broad sweeping statements because I think you had somebody on TWIV who was making the comment about how we talk about bat immunology, that they don't have this or they do this and they are the most interesting that, so, so, I forget, I think he's from Colorado. You can. Yeah, I think this is Tony Shouts. Yes, yes. Mm. So we could, we're looking through this through a non-bat lens, right? Because sting and all these other proteins were not discovered in bats. So we could say that this that these proteins that Brian mentioned that are not found in all bats, it doesn't mean that something that acts similarly that we just haven't discovered yet because we're not these are this is not the species we're typically probing to find new pathways. Um, so so I think it's a good context to think about when we when we look into animals like bats or other kind of uh, species we don't have a lot of information on. It is kind of we're funneling that through a lens of mice or cells, probably, right? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And people tend to look at a small number of bat species um, for any of these types of assays. Um, that's true both for the immunology side and for the virology side. And so Tony Shantz mentioned that by and large, when we're doing those studies to find coronaviruses in lots of different bats, in that case, we might be looking at bats in certain parts of Asia. And right. we don't necessarily know much about the, the viruses in bats in uh, North America. Um, similarly, we are choosing a couple of representative species of bats for most of these studies um, and not getting sort of all of the diversity of bats that there is. Right, right. It's very interesting to think about. Yeah, like what's up? I mean, we talk a lot about Asian bats because we find these coronaviruses in them and obviously that's a hot topic. But North American bats, like what's going on with them? Do they have the same type of abundance of RNA viruses? I don't it's interesting because I, I would suspect that the answer is probably yes, and mm. that we see more, uh, and you guys can tell me because you're more the virologist, that, but there's probably more jumping into human because there's more contact mm. between between the bats and the humans um, in Asia at the markets and, and various other locations. Definitely, I've, I've heard like in Africa where they are um, in contact with the fruit bats and the fruit bats carry the Nipahendra, right? And they, the people sit under the fruit trees right. and the fruit bats can excrete onto the people and that's where they can get some of these viruses. So it might be just ge geographical, you know, uh, closeness. Sure, like col guys, culture, is, uh, society yeah. and culture, yeah. Would you, would you guys agree with that? Are there differences there that I'm not aware of? 
I, I honestly am not sure and don't know that I have a great answer. Um, it's it's one of many things on the list of things <laughs> I'd love to know in thinking about all of this. <laughs> we did. I did post a Twitter, a tweet about, hey, yes. we'd love to talk about bat immunology. Who are some of your bat immunologists? Because I know a lot of bat virologists are people who study viruses and bats. And people suggested a whole host of of. People, so I think Brienne mentioned we we were talking that maybe we would try to schedule yes. someone. That'd be great. Come, yeah. So then we can you know get someone to answer all of these questions and yep. yeah, I can learn even more. Because the other question I have before we jump into the data is yeah. the leap from okay, we're talking about all these different viruses we're finding in bats. They're mostly RNA viruses, but then this is a DNA sensor, and so what what are the DNA viruses that bats have, or do we care? I, I think the leap <laughs> had to do more with DNA damage. Oh, oh, right, because of the uh, flying oxyphosphorylation. I gotcha. Yeah, okay. and so I think the link was that um, these bats are should be, in theory, undergoing uh, a lot of uh, DNA going into the cytosol because of this DNA damage, and could potentially, you know, be in an interferon-producing state frequently because <clears throat> of this large amount of DNA damage. And so the focus was on looking specifically at DNA sensors um, because of that DNA damage. Gotcha. They do have um, adenoviruses, ad herpes viruses, papilloma, and then a variety of single-stranded DNA viruses, but certainly far more RNA viruses hmm. okay. uh, than DNA viruses in bats. Fascinating. Yeah. 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 So um, – and, and when we say they have them, that means we can detect them being infected with it at that moment in time, right? Hmm, when we're well. sampling them. So <laughs> that's even, that's well, even we can detect more their, interesting. We can detect their genome, right? So Yeah, no one's like well, plucking out okay. these viruses. Nobody right. really is they, looking for infectivity. Okay, well, but if they have the genome, unless it's a DNA virus, like a herpes virus, one would anticipate that they had been think, infected yeah, in the to, near past or are currently infected, yeah, right? Maybe, maybe. Um, but I mean, I know Lin Fo Wang, who's on this paper, he told me yeah. that they readily isolate herpes viruses from bat urine. He said, no problem. Hmm. Wow. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Hmm. But but at what my point was, though, we don't really know how many they're, they actually get infected with because we don't really do much well, we couldn't really survey for antibodies, right? Because we don't really know what we would be looking for. So we, I think there are some antibody studies, but they're not sort of super broad. There, you know, there are studies that say yes, there are some bats that have antibodies against Ebola um, that have been used as part of the evidence uh, for the idea that bats might be a reservoir host for Ebola virus. Um, they can also get, you know, PCR of some of the genome out, but not the entire genome. Um, and so it's it's sort of circumstantial stuff like that. I'm not sure if anyone has done sort of super broad serology to get a full look at the bat virome. Yeah, it's hard because, for example, the coronavirus, you make an antibody against a nuclear protein of a bat coronavirus, right? You have to make it and then you can look or you, if you, you have to make the antigen at least if you want to look for antibodies. So right. it's not like you can make one reagent and <laughs> check all right so you yeah. it's right. it's hard it's hard to do it's I mean, really it's hard just, to do it's hard to be to, to sample bats to begin with and very few yep. people do it and but you know these Lin Fo Wang and others do it and uh, we did a paper on TWIV the, the pipe paper the Thailand pipe paper and they did look for antibodies I believe uh, in in Sierra and that's the other thing you have to collect Sierra which is you know <laughs> I mean, one way to sample bats is, and I remember this because Matt Freeman and Eric Donaldson years ago on Twitter, they said they, they captured bats in Maryland and they put up these mist nets, the bats fly into them. And then you get the bat and you put it in a paper bag for a few minutes and they poop in the bag and then you could let them go and then you got the poop, right? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, but the bleeding. But if you want serum, then, you know, you have to write, the protocol and it's a little harder because you then you have to capture them and and you don't want to kill them most so hmm. it's hard right and it's also you know you we don't have a lot of places don't have bat colonies yeah where they can do some of the experiments we're able to do with mice or with some of the other animal models yeah. that we use yeah. i would imagine now 
everything. I, you know, I hope that investment in bat immunology, it would be a logical choice, right? After what we were experiencing with, you know, pandemic potential viruses and bats, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I heard a, a talk by someone one time who was, who set up a giant, like, net thing in Africa somewhere and caught all these bats and we're breeding them and ex- doing experiments on the bats huh. actually in the, you know, like in the wild, but they're not in the wild. That's interesting. And they have to, it's really tricky because they, they keep them inside these nets and they're huge so that the bats can fly around and live, right? And they feed them and whatever, but you can't prevent them completely from contacting other animals and bats because mm, yeah. they can come up to the nets. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know. Maybe they double that to keep the other connections out. Oh, and that's or the problem with the, the colonies. They have to fly to have this yeah. high metabolic activity. Exactly. And they can't so just you fly have have in small circles. They have <laughs> a really to, large area. They, they fly yeah. large distances. Yeah. No, that's a limitation to bat colonies. They, they in general do not fly very much. Right. So, you know. <laughs> How relevant I mean, is I mean, it? The, the, what we're going to yeah. look at here yeah. in this paper is mostly cell lines, right? So that's right. an alternative. Exactly. Yep. Which don't fly either, by the way. <laughs> unless you put them on a plane. <laughs> right. Or in space. Or unless you're really angry and throw them. <laughs> in space, yeah. You, they're up in the International Space Station. That's right. Oh, you get angry and throw them across the room, Brian? Yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you could. <laughs> not, not if they're infected with some of these viruses. <laughs> no. That's true. <laughs> cool. All right. So should we get into the data? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was happy when you said this paper. How many figures is in this paper? It's very short. It's (laughs) It's a brief report. I was like, I had my coffee. It was like, you know, 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, all right, I'm ready to read Brian's paper. I'm like, oh, look at this. (laughs) Quick. Two paper, two figures. Yes. Um, So the first thing that they did was... uh, look at the uh, sequence of sting, the sting protein from 30 bat species um, from whom they could get the sequence and compared it to 10 um, other mammalian bat sting sequences. Um, And when they did that alignment, they found that uh, at position uh, 358 um, in all of the other mammals, the non-bats as they call it, um, which is in that C-terminal tail, there is a serine um, at that residue 358. And, that and that's serine, important, right? Yeah. That serine is known to be really important as a phosphorylation site to allow for the docking of um, TBK and of IRF and their interaction. Um, so they saw that there was a serine in all of these organisms, but when they looked at the 30 bats, um, none of them had a serine at this location. So they had some other amino acid. There were a few different amino acids that were seen, but none of them were serine. None of them were things that, well, a couple of them, I guess, could get phosphorylated, but not sort of the general uh, targets that we think of for phosphorylation there. I do see a tyrosine, so I can't say no phosphorylation. <laughs> Well, we have to keep in mind that this is what you said, thir- 30 yeah, strains this is 30 out of 1,600. Many, many, <laughs> yes. the, so. They do um, have a decent breadth in terms of the 30. Right. So, um, you know, they have um, bats that are, you know, from the Terrapis uh, genus. They've got some of the Myotis genus. They have, um, you know, some that we see in different areas of the world. So they they sort of have as much breadth as you could get, I guess, at this point, but certainly uh, not the full breadth of all bats. Um, and so they said, well, this, this makes us uh, hypothesize that the bat sting uh, signals a bit less than do some of these other sting proteins um, from humans. And so they hypothesize, well, you know, this sting signals a bit less. That's how bats um, avoid this excess interferon. So they took splenocytes from one uh, species of bats, uh, a rhinophilus species, um, which they point out was the host of Hmm. SARS-CoV-1. And members of the rhinophilus genus are uh, also members that people have talked about for (laughs) SARS-CoV-2, though obviously we don't know for certain uh, about that, Um, or splenocytes from mice. And they treat them with a small molecule called CGAMP. Uh, CGAMP is a small molecule that is made by the enzyme CGAS. And so CGAS is one of those DNA sensors 
Um, it actually stands for CGAMP synthase. <laughs> um, and it makes this uh, cyclic GMP AMP molecule that's able to bind to sting and signal to make interferon. And so they um, tr hit both the uh, bat splenocytes, the rhinophilus splenocytes, and the mouse splenocytes with CGAMP um, to mimic DNA signaling and see how well sting signals. And they see that the bat splenocytes transcribe less interferon and less interferon simulated genes compared to the mouse. Um, and both types actually make the same amount of interferon when stimulated with poly-IC um, to stimulate the RNA sensors. Um, and so it looks like this is a difference in sort of sensitivity to these DNA sensing pathways. It's, they also um, infect it with virus too, right? Yeah, they do. So they infect it with virus um, as well. Uh, and, um, but they... Uh, also, yeah. So Sorry, Sendai virus is an RNA virus, right? Yep. So they use Sendai, uh, an RNA virus, um, and they do see that um, they get less um, interferon production with the Sendai virus, the RNA virus, in the um, bat cells compared to the mouse cells. It, it is um, worth noting, of course, it, it's, oh my gosh, the lights just turned off in my, yeah. the office, I'm mean, completely <laughs> dark. I like, okay, have a well, party, okay. you know? I'm like waving. You need some, uh, <laughs> oh, those are the auto turn off lights. Brienne has yeah, those too. I do too. Yeah. I yeah. need to be more animated during the podcast, clearly. <laughs> um, I, so it's worth noting that they only did three cell, you know, three animals from, it says three cells from three animals each. Now they do not denote significant differences. I'm not, I'm just trying to, um, our, our, one of our, we, we've read some emails and one of the readers was a statistician, I think would like that I bring this up. I do not see um, stars denoting significance mm -hmm. like I do in C and the error bars are right. quite wide. And I'm, these are yeah. right outbred and they mentioned this outbred animals. These are not inbred mice. You're not going to have similar responses. Yeah. I think it would be worthwhile to have a couple more animals. I think that there are some measurements like, interferon beta for, you know, CGAMP stimulated, that, that's pretty obvious. But like the Sendai virus, mm -hmm. I would look at that and be like, oh, you know, I think I would need a couple of other animals to really try to tease out if that's true, real or not. I think the IRF7 differences are really yeah. minimal. Right? Oh, IRF7, yeah. I don't even think those are different at all. And interferon beta, I maybe... And, and I don't I see mean, differences in poly. I see the, really the only one I would believe here is the CGAMP stimulated interferon beta. Yeah. Um, is definitely the most profound here. Um, I, you know, I don't really see a difference with poly IC, and they they talk about it uh, that one as being not different. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, to be honest with you, I would not have picked IRF seven as my first um, interferon stimulated gene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the fact that that was the one that they went with uh, is a little bit surprising when you look at their uh, data in uh, the in B. They have um, next-gen sequencing of a lot of other mm. ISGs, and some of them are a bit more compelling than particularly that IRF7. A IRF lot more 7. compelling. Yes. Um, and so I think that the like when you ten actually— 10 times higher induction. Yeah, when you put um, B along with A, where they look at a broader set of genes, um, it is uh, more—the data is stronger. But, you know, I mean, this if you look at IRF7 in the transcript— Tenfold difference, but you know what are we looking at in A? Is that it's protein? Splenocytes. It's, it's transcripts, though, oh, right? Oh, it is. It's, right? it's, transcripts. Yeah, it's transcripts. Transcripts. Splenocytes. So, yeah. so I don't. I, I don't see. A, let me see here. So we're looking at um, this is C gamp and B in the transcripts, right? Okay, so mm -hmm. they're saying there's a tenfold. Do you think? I don't see a tenfold on panel one of A for for IRF seven yet in the transcripts. Table yeah. Blind. So I. So there's a, it's. I think maybe it was a difference in methodology. So I think B they're doing RNA seq bulk. On yeah. A, RNA seq. Yeah. So B is RNA seq and A is qPCR. Right. So okay, A is qPCR. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I guess you know you would use one to validate the other or vice versa. It would be nice to look at protein levels of these cytokines, but my assumption is they do not have. That yeah, I think that's the right, we're picking this apart. I, know, I mean, it's I hard enough to get some, you know, like pig and cow regions, let alone a bat. I region. know, like I'm dying about the, I, I, the ferret <laughs> regions. When you only right have, 
When you only have two figures, you know you're going to pick I know. it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think the reason why I'm being a little picky is because I do listen to people like Tony Shouns and some others who question yeah. this uniqueness of bats, you know, right. in their ability mm-hmm. to you know, have such different immune systems that we're kind of holding them up as these really unique species. So worth And this chatting. is a pillar paper, right? I mean, this is one of the first descriptions of a, a functionally yeah. different yeah. innate response. Yes. Within the bats. And so and people use this and it's mm-hmm. been cited many, yep. many times yep. as yes. a sure. as a pillar of, of bat immune responses being different. Right. Yep. Yep. So right. it's fair. It's so fair sorry, Lin Fo Wong, we're going to be critical, but we do like <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, well, yeah, I love it. But <laughs> oh, no, I think it gives me all sorts of ideas of things oh, yeah. to look at further. Um, and to, ex- I agree t- completely with Tony Shouts that bats are probably not the only uh, organisms that are unique reservoirs that have many viruses. Um, I know that his dear, dear mice, mice. Right. Um, mm-hmm. and some of the others are also fantastic reservoirs. Um but given the my interest in DNA sensing, I particularly <laughs> find this uh, rather intriguing. Um, so they basically take A and B and use them to say that there is a difference in how the sting protein from this rhinophilus species signals. Um, and they hypothesize that that is due to the difference in the uh, serine at um, 358 in sting. So they then do a luciferase reporter assay where they use um, HEC293 T cells and a luciferase reporter uh, plasmid along with um, sea gas and a version of sting. Um, And they use human sting, they get some uh, luciferase activity, and then they make a version of human sting that has that is missing the serine in question, and they see that the luciferase activity goes away. And then they um, make uh, use the versions of sting from three different bat species, either one from the myotis genus, um, one from uh, Terapis electo, which is one of those bat species people use pretty often, um, or one of the rhinophilus species. Um, and they show that in uh, all three cases, um, they are making um, relatively low amounts of interferon compared to when they made the same version um, that has a serine. Hmm. Um, The wild type versions of the three stings do not all make the same amount of interferon. Um, They're not all, um, you know, as low. Um, The therapist uh, sting actually makes it a bit more interferon than do the others. Um, 200 the, folds n- is, is nothing yeah. to, to uh, yeah. no, dismiss. No, not at all. <laughs> um, but uh, in all cases, they they do see a, a some increase when they put in um, the serine. I mean, this, su- this really suggests that that serine is somehow regulating the ability of sting in general to produce, in- to induce interferon, or at least the interferon, the IRF activity is what they're measuring out in this case, Right. So, right, I mean, you exactly. take human, you mutated, the, the ability goes away, you take the bat and you put it back, the serine, and you get an increase, regardless of the background level. So, that, that's pretty compelling data, I thought. So, yeah, I mean, I think it points to the fact that the serine is very important. So, Priyan, the this, this serine is needed for the interaction of TBK, the kinase, is that right? Um, so, it's needed for TBK. So, I think it's actually needed for IRF to come and bind um, and be brought into proximity with TBK so that TBK can phosphorylate it. So if you don't have a serine there, you're not completely inactive, right? No, you're not completely inactive, but you don't have this nice sort of efficient platform onto which um, the transcription factor can be brought. Yeah, because the bats don't have this phosphorylatable residue. So what, you know, obviously their sting has to still be active to some extent, right? Right. So, so the implication is without uh, phosphorylation, you can still function and get along it in the world, just right? Sucks. <laughs> yep. It just You just function a lot it's less. It's just wimpy. And of course, we'd yes. all love to see the binding of IRF correlate with the activity here, right? Of course. That, that would be, yeah. yes. that would be yeah. the coup de grace, right? But, 
Yes. And so they don't show that, although they do in one of their supplemental figures um, look at IRS fo IRF phosphorylation. Um, and they do see the change in IRF phosphorylation yes. ability, but they don't look at IRF binding to mm -hmm. staying here. It's funny that they even had a supplemental figure. Like, just put that sucker yes. in the main figure. Like, <laughs> yeah. you got room. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe there's I, a you know, requirement for a short yeah, communication sure. has to have two figures or something, you know, maybe. Yeah. Well, I, I was very much uh, looking at their IRF uh, phosphorylation as we have been doing a fair amount of that recently ourselves. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very cool. Uh, and it's funny, right around the time that we were preparing for this, I, had, I was on Twitter and I'm looking at it now. There's somebody. Uh, do you guys know John Jake? College, yeah, I know of John Jay College. Okay, it's here in New York City. Uh, yes, yeah. in New York City. Yeah. Okay, uh, the investigator is Angeline Corthals, and she published. She they just recently published a paper in Molecular Ecology, and they did this wide scale genome sampling and saw some pretty cool things. So obviously, in addition to what we're talking about, where they're like, there's the loss of the Pihen family, um, but they mm -hmm. they are uh, maybe this is a paper we can do in the future, but. You know, looking at expansions of APOBEC3 and MHC1 gene families, the loss of the pro inflammatory gene uh, pihens, and really just some unique things about natural killer gene complexes. So I think the evidence is going to keep building, and there's going to be more than like what you said, just this paper to kind of lead us into understanding why they're so different. Yeah. And, and in some ways, I think this also gets at an important aspect of just comparative immunology in general. Um, you know, we're saying bats are special, but maybe that's just because we don't look at enough different types of organisms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably true. Well, you know, birds fly, so what do they have at this residue, right? So and we we talked about that on TWIV. Yeah, what yeah. about um, birds? Are we they, about this? I mean, it's a very different, um, I mean, they have very different, they have yeah. coronaviruses too, by the way, they have... Yeah, they do. So birds all have a serine at this residue. I actually oh. went back and did the alignment after that to an episode. Oh, wow. <laughs> I should publish that. Committed. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so birds do all have a serine. Um, and I don't think that they have the same, um, metabolic things going on that bats do, mm. um, to allow mm. for flight, but I am so not an expert. <laughs> but I, I mean, birds, mm. birds, fly as much as bats do, right? If not more. So what's the story? I mean, must there must be some reason, right? Because I'm, I'm sure they make a lot of oxy, uh, oxy, oxy radicals, right? I, you need, mm, just, just like bats, I why not? I don't know. The, the only thing I do know is that they can short circuit their uh, fatty acid oxidation cycle or Krebs cycle yeah. to make heat because they're, they, they don't, generate the heat they don't regulate their heat the temperature the same way we do mm. i'm stumbling over things but i but i do know that they can do that but that doesn't really explain any of the flight related things hmm. yeah but they fly way higher too and it's cooler oh that's well i mean when they're flying long distance right yeah we need to get some ecologists on here right yeah <laughs> yeah it's true we do yes we're we, we get to the limit of my bird immunology when I can say <laughs> oh, that they I'm don't already have. Past my limit. <laughs> oh, well, the only, the only other point that I have is I know they don't have bone marrow. Oh, yes, right. I do know that. Right. Uh, and lymph nodes. Yes. Um, but the one other thing I really like that they do with this paper is that the, the um, reconstitution uh, luciferase reporter assay was done in human cells, HEC 293 T cells. Um, and one could say, well, okay, you're making this bat um, sting protein interact with human IRF mm -hmm. and human TBK. And so perhaps it's not working as well, because not because of the uh, change in the amino acids, uh, but because it's trying to interact with human proteins. Yeah. And so they also um, get a bat cell line, um, PACI cells, um, which are terapist electo, which is where the PA comes from kidney cells, um, which is where the KI <laughs> comes from, um, and do this experiment in PACI cells as well to show that they get the same type of, of pattern um, in those PACI cells. And so they put the rhinophilus sting um, in the PACI cells and get the same pattern 
of reduced uh, activity that is reconstituted when they get um, when they put in the serine containing sting. Um, and they show that there are differences in how well those cells um, allow for herpes virus infection. Um, so they also infect those cells either with um, the human sting, with human sting with alanine, bat sting, bat sting with serine, um, and look at virus infection. Um, and the uh, versions of sting that seem to be better at inducing interferon also have less uh, HSV replication. Hmm. Interesting. But it's twofold effect, yeah. right? Yeah, it's it's not huge, and I you know I'm not sure that this is a great you know way to actually look at what's going on with herpes in your immune system yeah. when you're neglecting the adaptive immune response and all of those other pieces. I mean, the question really is: okay, so you need to dampen sting to deal with flying, but how do you deal with viruses? Because if you've dampened it, what's going? You know, you would think the viruses would overtake you, and they they don't hurt, harm you, so. We don't have an answer to that, basically, right? Right, we don't. The you know the only thing that someone could could talk about, and I don't know if I totally believe this, but one could say, well, they're not getting harmed because they're not making that interferon hmm. um, to lead to the pathology. Yeah, um, but I'm I don't think all the pathology is interferon no. and, and immune mediated. The viruses do something, right? Right, <laughs> they they do. Viruses <laughs> are important. <laughs> <laughs> so. I well, think and, we they, have and they can directly damage. That's a point, right? Um, yeah, so yeah, when yes. you're infected, there's two sources of pathology. Mm -hmm. One is mediated by the the uh, infectious agent itself, yep. which causes cell lysis and recruitment of things that then indirectly um, the immune system causes damage as well. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So that you have to deal with both, I think. And yeah. We are, we are a ways from getting well, an answer. Well, I, right. I guess I guess we always talk about the innate immune system being there at the beginning, kind of hold things in check until you get the adaptive immune system up and running and educated, and then the adaptive immune system comes in and clears out the virus. And 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 these bats have antibodies. They have T cells. They can measure all of that. I mean, they have NK cells. They have you know. Various different. I, I was looking. They they haven't identified eosinophils or and some other basophils and some mast cells and things yet. But um, but they identify the ma major classical hematopoietic derived cells in these in these animals. So one would imagine that they are developing their um, adaptive immune responses, and so those would eventually clear the virus. Yeah, but don't we always think if you have an efficient innate response, you really can. If it's inefficient, like SARS-CoV-2 yeah. overcomes, right, and, and then you have a fulminant infection that the adaptive can't handle, right? So, how do the bats deal with it? Yeah, <laughs> right? it, it must be. So, I, I would imagine it must be something to do with the cells, right, um, and the ability uh -huh. of, you know, if we're talking about pathology, especially for like SARS-CoV-2, you have a recruitment of of cells that are secreting inflammatory cytokines, mm -hmm. and so maybe that they those cells as well are dampened in their responses. And, and the other thing, you know, we, we say that they're infected with a lot of viruses, but of course we don't know if they are actually infectious. It's just a lot of RNA. And so maybe the dogma of like these animals are, are infected asymptomatically with so many viruses is not really true. It's actually maybe their body does a really good job of, uh, processing the peptides of the virus, they break them down and it's just like RNA hanging around in the guano. Now, somebody who's been doing this for a while may can write in and say, no, actually this is true. They do have more in viruses that infect them. But I, I just think the same way we sample them in our limited reagents kind of pigeonholes us into the way we think about their immune response. Yeah. Well, and going on the point that you made earlier, you know, we talk about bats have so many viruses um, and we think about these things like the you know study in the Thailand um, irrigation uh, pipe where we find a huge number of viruses in bats. But that doesn't mean that every member of a particular species mm -hmm. is harboring all 500 viruses that you might find. Um, we know that different mem different individuals might have one or two viruses. We And the way that we do this sampling doesn't necessarily tell us if the yeah. majority of bats oh, are infected right, right. with a particular yeah. virus mm -hmm. or if a minority are actually Right, infected. because you're collecting yeah. guano. I mean, I don't know how they did, if they just collected guano that had fallen or if they actually got the bats themselves, but it's a minority population sample, so you can't apply it 
to all bats. Yeah, I mean, if you just sample guano, yeah. there's some bats live in colonies of multiple millions of bats, right? Yeah, I, I think we don't really know. It's not enough sampling done. And I get asked all the time <laughs> by journalists, why do bats have so many viruses? And the only reason they ask that is because SARS came from bats and NEPA and maybe Ebola, and they get three, oh, the bats must have a lot of viruses, but they don't even know about the virome studies, right? So <laughs> the science doesn't really, I mean, I know that Linfa has been arguing for years uh, with Peter Dashak, who didn't think bats were any more special than others. And I think that's what Chounce feels as well, right? Yes, that's In terms what he of feels number well. of viruses. So I, I don't know. I get the feeling we just don't have enough sampling yet. Right. But I, I guess you can say that they are harboring imp viruses of importance for humans. Sure. Sure. Well, because they spill over periodically and infect right. us, right? And so but, the but, spillover but, aspect might be an interesting thing. Why why is that happening? Is it really just contact? Because we, you know, farmers have lived in contact with lots of different species for a long time. Yet but the spillover mice, seems mice, to be more mice are, from bats. Mice are sources of a lot of spillovers as well. Plague. Right. Yeah. They don't they don't get a lot of attention, but and you know, they don't typically cause <laughs> pandemics, but, you know, hantaviruses and uh, other viruses have come from mice. So, uh, you know, why the ones from bats can be a big issue, we don't know. Yeah, that I, is I a know. super interesting yeah, question, I, right? Don't yeah, know. I think the, the, the argument that people make on that one is that because of this unique immune system, the viruses have evolved differently they may be. and thus sort of interact with our immune system differently. Yeah, um, it could be. I mean, but we... We need to do a lot more, you know, we Agreed. need to actually be doing a lot of this in bat cells yeah. um, and in primary bat cells, not in the cultured cells. And so the know, idea is really that trying to do this. Somehow the bad viruses have evolved with this dampened immune system. And they've learned to behave there and they get into a person. And they go, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, the hey. human immune. So that's the, the implication is that there's more immunopathology when a bad virus gets into people. And I guess the two SARS Corona support that, right? And MERS does as well. Yeah. And I think one, um, when we think about studies that are done on bat viruses, I, I read that a lot of them are passaged first in our traditional lines and culture, and then they'll go into bat lines to analyze them. And so yeah. there could be some changes that occur during those initial cultures. And so we still need a si significant amount of work that's done on primary isolates from and then cultured in bat cells to really understand yeah. if, yep. if they're going to study, you know, receptors and uptake and, and initial infections and replication. Yep. Yep. Good point. Yep. Awesome. Hmm. Well, do yeah. we think um, we have time <laughs> for a couple Emails. I, I don't know if we have more bat things we want to chat about. I have until I have like fifteen more minutes until I have to go to another we can meeting. Do a couple of emails, sure. Yeah. You, you're done, right? Yeah, Brianna, I didn't want to cut I you am off. Done. No, I I am done. I mean, I think this stuff is really fascinating, but I have no more answers. <laughs> <laughs> we can still so all, yeah. all of this speculation um, is you know stuff that I really find exciting, and I would love to know why they you know what they're doing without pie hen genes. Yep. Yeah. Well, whether to just to finish that up, I think I read that there were still 15 to 20 percent of the genes in bats that have not been well characterized. And so there could be if we mine those a analogs, you know, not direct right. orthologs that might be functionally um, doing the same type of thing, but maybe by a different domain recognition mechanism right. that we haven't found yet. Yeah, possibly. All right, let's do let's do a round of email. How's that? Sure, sure. Um, Cindy, can you take that first one? <clears throat> okay. So Lisa writes, "Happy New Year to the Immunoverse All Stars." Uh oh, uh -oh. <laughs> I think that tells us we are behind in our email. Um, I am listening to uh, this podcast. Will kill you. Um, podcast on poison ivy. I was happy to learn that Ursul. How do you guys say that? I always say Ushul. Arishiel? Arishiel. Yeah, that's Arishiel. Arishiel. Oil. Yeah, compounds like those in poison ivy are used to glaze Japanese pottery, which makes sense. It's a phenolic resin. 
Also, Benadryl doesn't work so well against the poison ivy symptoms in humans because the delayed poison ivy symptoms are due to a T cell response, which seems to be almost exclusive to humans. Hmm. This was news to me, and I thought y'all might like to discuss this immune response so that many of us, that many of us have experienced. Um, also, I've always observed that poison ivy made me crazy at the same times every day. I crazy itching wise i'm not really <laughs> sure about that but uh, what do we know about the effects of circadian rhythms and t-cell activity in the body i'm grateful to you all and the sibling microbe shows thank you vincent for all the hard work of trying to evolve a more educated public sincerely lisa so um first uh i had no idea that they mm -hmm. use ushu oil, oil uh, to make japanese pottery that's interesting at least there's some useful <laughs> thing for it besides <laughs> making us crazy um the benadryl is interesting because uh, so benadryl is an h1 histamine receptor antagonist there are mm. four histamine receptors i believe um but h1 is the main one um that is responsible um, for histamine uh, sequelae when you have these type 1 hypersensitivity allergic reactions. So there are four hypersensitivity reactions. Type 1 is the immediate where you react vigorously and immediately. Those are typically bee stings or food allergies where you have swelling like right away. Um, those are life threatening. Um, and so Benadryl works really well against those. Um, but Interestingly, um, the, the poison ivy reaction is a type four reaction. And so the first three are antibody mediated. The last one is T cell mediated. And we often call that delayed type hypersensitivity reactions. And so if you get poison ivy exposure and you've had previous exposure, usually it's about 24 to 48 hours before you get a reaction to it. And it's because we know that even if you have memory T cells around, they still need to be reminded of what's of that their what they respond to is something they should respond to and 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 amplify and proliferate and come to the vector site and cause the damage. Um, so that still happens now. Would Benadryl work at all? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's typically advised to take when you're having um, poison ivy, but I could imagine that due to the role of mast cells in causing vasodilation and allowing that to better um, get the T cells into the tissue to cause the pathology might have some beneficial effects. Um, it certainly would make you sleepy, so you would not itch as much. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, as far as the... Um, the crazy time at the same time every day. I'm assuming that it, the itching drives you crazy the same time every yeah, day. Yeah, I'm assuming and that's what that <laughs> the, that's what Lisa meant was like the same time every day. I, it's I think so. Maybe yes. First one to It's always up or, in the evening, right? Whenever you when you have whenever you have an infection, you always have fever spikes in the evening. <laughs> whenever you have allergic reactions, you have you know spikes in the evening. Mm. That is that is known, and there are circadian regulation of um, immune cell uh, uh, circulation and function as well. And we have talked about that. Did any of you look up which episode that was? We did talk about circadian regulation. One. Yeah, it was really early on, like in the first two or three yep. episodes, I think. I can pull um, it up that we, now, which one, but yeah. yeah, we did talk about that. And basically this, so cells are more likely to go into the lymph node at night and they're the more likely to circulate in the body during the day, Give you know, ish but that Number that two. crossover time point from them going back i guess is when they're most likely to cause their their issues um, in the tissues. That was episode number 2. two. God, wow. I thought it was really early yeah. on. November yeah. 25th, 2017. Yeah. So so yeah, um I I don't know if if you should take Benadryl um when you have that. Do you know Vincent whether um physicians usually recommend that? Don't know. Yeah, no. I don't know. I yeah, I I don't, I don't think so, but I'm not really sure. I get it pretty um, bad and I've the, never been prescribed it. If it gets bad yeah, enough, steroids it, yeah. is usually. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Prednisone, mm -hmm. pre prednisone yep. Yeah. So Just one thing that's really interesting response. here is what the antigen is yes. um, that the T cells are seeing. Um, because, you know, with T cells, you're generally talking about a protein antigen. And so what's happening here is the erythriol is actually modifying a self protein. Hmm. 
Um, and that's what you're making the immune response to. Uh, it's not the erythritol itself. Right. Hmm. Cool. Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Um, let's see here. Andrew? Yeah. Andrew writes, Kia Ora from Pangora. <laughs> Pongaroa. Online, I have just... I'll look it up. Pangaroa? Pangaroa, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. It's in New Online. Zealand, it's in New Zealand oh. by the way. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. So what is Kia Ora? Probably hello. It's kind of yeah. like hello, yeah. That's like hello for mm. New Zealand. Okay. Online, I have discovered several people who have dissociative identity disorder, previously multiple personality disorder, that with very interesting stories to tell. One or two rep report that different alters, different persons in the same body have different reactions to allergens depending on who is in control of the body. Huh. My first thought was that this is psychosomatic, but I looked in Google Scholar and I can see that variations in allergic reactions in these people is a recognized and real thing, along with other physiological changes like differences in visual acuity, medication responses, plasma glucose levels in diabetic patients, and more. Sadly, I am shut out of reading more by paywalls. So my question is, as allergies are mostly an immune response, what is going on here? Is there a known mechanism where this can be explained? From Andrew. That's fascinating. I did not know that. Did you know about this? Nope. Yeah, I, I have read about this. So there's a there's a book that's called The Body Keeps the Score, and it talks about how you um, manifest stress physically. And so that's interesting. But there is also this idea that these multiple personalities, they have different, like very different physiologies, which is just fascinating. Hmm. I don't wow. know. Maybe, maybe because of their different stress levels and their different personalities, that how you behave can actually also regulate your physiology. So we know that, like, if you meditate, sure. you can lower your body uh, um, pulse and blood pressure and stuff. So it goes both ways, right? So how your body reacts affects your mind, and how your mind reacts affects your body. So who knows? It's fascinating. Huh. That's pretty cool. Yeah, wow. it'd have to be something to do because I'm because I'm thinking of it from like an immunological perspective. I mean, we're gonna the same person is gonna have the same like MHC, right? You're not gonna you're mm -hmm. gonna have like two different divergent. Or are you thinking of it? But, in, but the same people have the same eyes, and one will require glasses and one will not. How, how do you explain that? That is. It's interesting. Like, I mean, I, I don't get it. I don't understand. They have different blood pressures. Yeah, that's crazy. How can that be? Yeah. Right. Wow. I mean, it's just, wow. Weird. Can you, let's I, put that in the show notes. What's the book called? Mine. What is it? What'd you say, Cindy? The body keeps the score. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to read that. I think that's the name of it. <laughs> My ample spare time. Yeah, I, <laughs> Oh. I, I know that there are a couple of situations where there are um, sort of other types of um, psychiatric um, issues that are triggered by um, microbes and are related to immune responses. Yeah, sure. Um, and so um, I one of my students once did a report on something called PANDAS, um, which was the first I had learned of it, but uh, it was uh, something uh, like that. And so I guess if if we can imagine different immune responses altering different uh, aspects of uh, your psychiatric state that way, then I guess it could go the other way too. But I don't know. That's yeah. It seems so unbelievable, but yeah, interesting. Uh, uh, Steph, can you take the next? Sure, one? sure. Iyala. Yep. Ayala writes, Dear Prof. Vincent and other immune hosts, firstly, I love your podcast. I listen to every episode you post uh, in this show and on TWIV, and I'm very excited to finally have a good reason to contact you in person. I'm writing because my lovely four-year-old niece asked my brother a really good question just before she went to sleep when all of her philosophical life-concerning questions appear. She wanted to know whether all animals have nasal mucus as humans have. Small literature search taught me that all mammalian birds and some fish do have it. However, it was hard to understand if they were referring to a more general mucus coastal first line of defense mechanism 
um, and other body parts such as the lungs and the gut, for example, or if all of these animals do secrete mucus out of their nose or gills as a defense mechanism to prevent bacteria or viral infection or to get rid of dust and other unwelcome particles. She specifically asked about horses, cows, dolphins, spiders, snails, butterflies, turtles, alligators, dot, dot, dot. I hope this question is not too random given that most of the world's interest today is around COVID-19. Thank you for your time. I appreciate everything you do. And she's from Israel. And it's a great question. I There was a book called, I think it's called All Animals Poop. And we should do a book called, Animal, you know, All Animals Have Mucus or at least some type of mucosal organ, right? Um, in, a, in different ways. So mammals surely all make mucus. Now, whether or not how their nose structure is. So like I'm in the fair world right now, have really excellent long nasal turbinates that produce tons of mucus and and we can study the respiratory responses to respiratory infections. Um, But yeah, uh, gosh, cows, horses, they all produce mucus in their nose. Um, Cindy had a couple thoughts. So obligate nose breathers that can die from simple upper respiratory infections. I would imagine like porcupines would have different immune responses in their nose to deal with that issue, right? That they're really only breathing through their nose and not the nose and the mouth. Yeah. Hmm. Um, And then, you know, we're getting into animals that I don't study and don't know much about, but insects, um, they have hemolymph inside their exoskeletons, but you know, what type of mucus they produce. I'm sure they, they produce some type of mucus equivalent, right? Um, but yeah, I don't, know. I, I don't know. I could definitely confidently say that all, you know, the mammalian species are producing some type of mucus. Uh, but, but the, but the insects and butterflies, you know, I'm not super sure about that. I definitely don't know about the um, reptiles either. I don't know about the reptiles either. Um, we know, I mean, fish, ha- you know, on their gills, they do secrete mucus like substances, um, and, and, and the goal of it is to like, like the, like she mentioned to remove particulates that there are many different protective factors that, uh, anti, um, antimicrobial peptides, but then also just like the actual viscosity of it, um, to help prevent binding of pathogens to the cell surfaces. Mm-hmm. So yeah, mucus is very special. It's very special and it's very hard to deal with. I, we're, we're working with um, trying to identify mucus proteins and there are different proteins based on molecular weight, but it's very hard to separate, to separate those out and really determine. So there's certain types of mucus proteins that um, induce inflammation, but there's some that regulate inflammation, but then it's dependent on their size. And so it's, it's, it's difficult to... to um, you know, figure those out, but yeah. How many proteins are there in mucus stuff? Do you know? That's a good question. That's like the question somebody asked me the other day of, of what proportion of antibodies are against uh, microbes in our own body compared to pathogens. I'm like, how many? Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know, but I will look that up, Vincent. I will find it. Ah, oh, the light has, <laughs> the light went off again for the people who are listening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I'll look that up though. How many proteins of mucus? There we go. Yeah. Just yeah. curious. All right, well, last one from Tim. I take a non-prescription H1 receptor antagonist, cetirazine for pollen allergy. I think it's tree pollen, but I don't know which species and usually end up taking cetirazine daily from April and June. I've recently had my first dose of Moderna SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and was curious to know if there might be any impact on vaccine efficacy improvement or otherwise of pausing antihistamines around the time of the jab. Okay, now we know Tim is from the UK. Mm. I read a few papers and articles on the role of hist or uh, yeah, on the role of histamine in the immune system, but the only conclusion I reached was that, as I suspected, I was stupendously out of my depth, <laughs> <laughs> as we all are. If yeah. pausing in the histamines around the time of vaccination could be beneficial, what sort of time period might be a good bet? pollen gets too much, I could don an FFP3 about an N99 mask instead while si- whilst sitting at my desk. <laughs> it's another one. And my home office faces a busy footpath, so I risk passersby and neighbors assuming I have s- extreme COVID paranoia, but I think I can put up with that. Thanks. Well, according to the CDC, uh, they say um, administration of antihistamines um, – to COVID-19 vaccine recipients prior to vaccination to prevent allergic reactions is not recommended. Um, now, that's to prevent allergic reactions to the vaccine. Right. 
but they don't say whether they're worried about, you know, in, impeding immune responses. So I don't know. Anybody know? I don't, I don't know what you guys think, but I think it's similar to what we were talking about before when we responded to the other email. I, I don't I don't see a direct connection how that would be impacting your ability of mm -hmm. your dendritic cells to move to lymph node, present antigens, and activate T cells and B cells. There might be, you know, a slight impact if you contract a COVID mm -hmm. of being able to mobilize those immune cells and get them to the tissue um, and, uh, you know, from through the blood vessels and out into the tissue. But even then, I think it would be minor. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't I don't see a mm -hmm. biological way it would be major impact. I agree completely. Yeah. Well, good mm -hmm. questions, though. Great questions. Right? Great questions. All right. That'll do it for 46 Show notes, microbe.tv slash immune. That's where you can find all the links, questions or comments, immune at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Now that we have a new studio, we need your support even more. <laughs> you can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. <laughs> Steph Langles at Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thank you, Steph. Yeah, thanks. This was fun. And Brianne Barker is at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on Immune by Steve, Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. <laughs> <laughs>